Hello. My name is Sarah Pasquale, known as Pasquale or PQ due to the enduring popularity of my first name. I'm a lead graphic designer for film and television, a world I've been working in for more than 25 years. I've been tying myself in knots about this lecture since receiving Becky Chilcott's email on the 15th of November, 2020, asking me to participate on Bob's very kind recommendation. My instinct was yes, of course, because I absolutely love Bob and St. Bride's Foundation. I absolutely love my job and I like talking, just not in public. So that's when the reality struck. I haven't written anything structured or coherent since my postgraduate dissertation several lives ago, so apologies for reading this like an awkward best person speech at a wedding. I firmly believe in staying behind the camera unless there are exceptional circumstances, which in my case have been playing a child prodigy in Fellini's Casanova when I was nine years old, being an extra in Derek Jarman's The Garden, and The Girl Who Looks Nothing Like Jordana, my favourite credit, in Richard Ayoade's Submarine, which I art directed, as well as doing the graphics with the talented Chris Rosser. As you can see, life has offered me occasions where it really would be rude to say no. I'm also exceedingly proud of my nose, but that's another story. I don't remember how I found out about St Bride's existence, as it was in pre-Google days. It was 1997 to be exact, and I was working on a TV series called Big Women, which was about a feminist publishing house. It was set from 1960s onwards, and I needed to know what size paper and what kind of paper they would have used in the typing pool. I distinctly remember telephoning St Bride's on a landline, and a cheerful voice at the other end, without needing to look it up, informed me that in the UK, the paper would have been full scap folio, which measures eight inches by 13 inches, and that it was used till the 1980s. The secretaries would have sandwiched a piece of carbon paper between two sheets of paper, the top one being the master copy on decent paper, the lower one a thinner paper, which would be the carbon copy kept as a record for filing. He also told me the name of the different papers, onion paper was mentioned and never forgotten, and their weight, and helpfully added that legal stationers still sold paper that size and those weights. That was Nigel, Bob's predecessor. Ever since, St. Bride's has been my first port of call on any period film I do. Google has its limitations and the internet is fine, but also has a habit of lying. Books are great, but we seldom have time to read the small print accompanying the pretty pictures. I need to see and feel and hold the thing that I'm trying to emulate, particularly if it's something papery, so I know what size it should be, what kind of paper to use. Does the ink bleed or not? Does it leave an imprint? Is it stuck together with glue, sellotape, staples, or paper clips? Are these calling cards embossed, debossed, or merely printed? Were these maps printed in bulk, or were they all drawn by hand? The plots of the Guernsey Potato Pie Literary Society and The Last Letter from Your Lover are all about the correspondence between the main characters. Handwriting in the 40s looks quite different from someone's handwriting now and changes from one country to the other. And I mean handwriting, not calligraphy, which is a different kind of skill. St. Bride's has many letters that one can use as reference for that. Frankly, nothing beats Bob's specialist knowledge and his way around all of St. Bride's resources. There are myriads of books and periodicals about printing, typography, newspaper design and papermaking, about printed, written, carved and cast words and a great deal of the related equipment so that Bob can explain and illustrate how something is achieved. This too helps me work out how to make the graphic prop authentic and believable. When you handle these previous, these precious treasures, you find you have even more questions which Bob invariably is able to answer. The title of this lecture is inspired by St. Bride's, which I am, but it also makes me an imposter. I'm not inspired. I literally cannot do my job without the institutions like St. Bride's. Explaining my work explains why. Mina Lima, through their work on the Harry Potter films and Annie Atkins, thanks to Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel, have brought attention and shed light on graphic design in film and television, though people outside the industry seldom know about the minutiae of this role. At the risk of being patronizing, because we may know this already, all the places you see in films and television programs are created by the art department and set decorating teams. Sometimes we build the sets, other times we find suitable locations, but very rarely do we shoot places as we find them. We time travel flats and houses into places from different centuries. We turn spaces into police stations, hospitals, books, bookshops, supermarkets, restaurants and bars. We turn Liverpool into New York, Greenwich into Moscow. 
It's about creating a believable, authentic world in which the story of the script tells can take place. The graphics we produce are part of that. In simple terms, any words that are visible that have been provided by the graphic design department, quite often a department of one. This can be the sign above the shop, the advert on the billboard, the writing on the side of a van, the label on a wine bottle, the restaurant menu, the handwritten letter, a passport, a poster, a book, a book cover, a map. And we're obsessive about detail. The successful graphic is what I call a wallflower graphic. It's there subliminally setting the tone and driving the story forward without being noticed other than subconsciously. It should be exactly as it should be. If it isn't, I haven't done it right. Often we have to simplify the graphics so that the audience can read and understand the content in the under a minute the camera focuses on it or sweeps past it. We make a judgment call on how much or how little we leave in. Or if it's something handled by the actors, we call it an action graphic, which should also help the actors themselves immerse themselves in the world they're making the audience believe. A common action graphic in contemporary projects are cell phones and computers. Those tap text conversations and type documents on screen don't happen for real. They're carefully planned, timed interactive animations so that the actors can concentrate on acting and not the action. I find these particular screen graphics challenging, but I have a secret weapon, the brilliant Richard Oldfield at CompuHire. Sometimes we design decorative elements without words, such as wallpaper or tiles, or floor coverings such as lino or carpet, particularly for period films because the originals no longer exist except in a reference book or photograph. Once we've read the script, the first thing we do is to start our research and we need a fast track to becoming erudite experts on whatever the script requires. In a matter of weeks, I went from the late 70s and 90s of Mamma Mia 2, here we go again, some of it in Greek, not a language I speak or can write in, to Shakespearean war drama, The King, set in 15th century England and France. On that, I even got to design some decorative props, objects that were 3D printed thanks to our wonderful prop master, Paul Purdy, who taught me what to do. I love learning new skills. Well, here is a somewhat eclectic selection of my work to better illustrate all that I have said thus far. Some of it is by other people's fair hand as I work within a team, most often with the talented Kelly Waugh and Georgina Millett, and our amazing assistants, Sarah Bradby and Francesca Bennell. We also outsource to other talents. This is a map that we made for Alice Through the Looking Glass. This is one that we made for the King, Mamma Mia 2. I got obsessed with putting the chapel detail in, though you can see from the photograph of the set that we'll never see it. This is dressing for the king. The ivory boxes are the 3D printed objects I learned to draw. This shows some calligraphy for one of the things we made and one of five decorative banners embroidered in India that never got used. Tapestries, many, many, many flags, these are two London street signs for Paddington 2. I have bought Alistair Hall's book, London Signs for Future Reference. This was turning Liverpool into New York for Florence Foster Jenkins with a street sign number plate on the cost of a taxi ride in American sense. These are menus from Paddington 2, Mamma Mia 2, and the end of the fucking world too. I love this one because I got to draw the amazing cafe for the front cover. The excellent designer, Dick Lunn, designed and built this in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in Wales. This is a newspaper from Paddington forwarding the plot. And here's one from the two popes. Florence Foster Jenkins is my favorite job ever. Designed by the amazing Alan MacDonald, one of the most talented and lovely humans I've ever met. Here's some posters from it, a program. A letter written by Florence, so we had to imitate the real Florence's writing. And then the other letter is forwarding the plot in Paddington 2. Um, Max Perkins, Colin Firth's character and genius, marking up a manuscript, an action prop with many repeats. We also make dressing for people's wallets and pockets, which will probably never get seen. And also we make rubbish for the rubbish bins, especially when it's a period film. These are medicines for the pharmacy in the end of the fucking world too. For the Guernsey potato pie, we have to reproduce Foles' bookshop. So we produced all these book covers in a couple of days. Last notice boards, my pet hate along with hospitals and police stations, which are also full of notice boards. 
Last but not least, wrapping paper for Florence Foster Jenkins. If you want to see more of what I do, I will be launching a website soon, pasqualigraphics.com. My Instagram is pasqualigraphics. Thank you so much for listening and watching.